Let's go over the three question warm up for Farm Basics 11. First question, what are the four main pharmacokinetic equations? So make sure you know these equations. First of all, volume of distribution equals the amount of drug given in IV form divided by the concentration of that drug in plasma. So that's volume of distribution equals D over C. Clearance is 0.7 times the volume of distribution divided by the half-life. The loading dose is the concentration at steady state times the volume of distribution. So LD equals CSS times the volume of distribution. And then the maintenance dose is the concentration at steady state or the target plasma concentration times the clearance. So maintenance dose equals concentration times clearance. Next, what effect does changing KM and Vmax have on potency and efficacy? So decreasing the KM of reaction means you need less of the substance to achieve one half Vmax. So a lower KM means a higher potency. In other words, KM is inversely related to potency. But changing KM doesn't affect efficacy at all. And then an increase in Vmax means that the reaction will have a greater velocity even if the amount of substrate remains constant. So this is an increase in effectiveness or efficacy. So Vmax is directly related to efficacy. So a higher Vmax means a higher efficacy, but changing Vmax does not affect potency. Next, what drug categories do each of the following medications fall under? So Losartan is an angiotensin receptor blocker, an ARB. Vecuronium is a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drug. Ticarcillin is a penicillin antibiotic. It's a cell wall inhibitor. Dicipramine is a tricyclic antidepressant. Enalapril is an ACE inhibitor. Lorazepam is a benzodiazepine. Rosiglitazone is one of the thiazolidine diones that increase insulin sensitivity and that we use that in type 2 diabetes. All right, now that you're good and warmed up, you're ready for the lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to our step one video on drug side effects. Now farm can be a little dry because sometimes you just have to memorize a list of drugs. But today we're going to try to make that a little less painful. We're going to group these drugs together by side effect. So we won't be going drug by drug, we'll be going side effect by side effect. Now we'll also have some clinical vignettes uh, to start off each section so you can get an idea of how you might see these on your test. And we'll also throw in a few game shows to help with retention as well. So let's go through this. The first section we're going to go through is cardiovascular side effects. So let's go through these. So our first vignette here is a 34-year-old man in the hospital is being treated for a severe methicillin-resistant staph aureus osteomyelitis when he develops a full-body cutaneous flushing. So what's causing the flushing? Well, when you hear about MRSA, you always think about the treatment, which is going to be vancomycin. So this is going to be red man syndrome. So remember, this isn't a drug allergy per se. There is a lot of histamine going on. Uh, but you do have to slow down the infusion and pre-treat with antihistamine to help prevent this from happening again. But what else can cause flushing? Well, think about niacin. That causes a lot of cutaneous flushing. We use that uh, for low HDL patients. Uh, adenosine is a very potent vasodilator, and it can also cause cutaneous flushing as well. The dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers can also cause this by way of smooth muscle relaxation as well. Let's move on to coronary vasospasm. So this can be caused by things like cocaine. And also along with cocaine, you can have amphetamines, uh, methamphetamines. That can cause that vasoconstriction in the coronary arteries as well. Your tryptan drugs like sumatriptan, er uh, ergotamines, these can also cause coronary vasospasm. This doesn't happen very often, but we generally don't give tryptans uh, to patients with coronary artery disease or strokes. Our next side effect is dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, and this is associated with a couple of things, doxorubicin and donorubicin, and I always group these two together because these are both anti-cancer drugs. Next we have torsades de points, so this is that twisting of the points, that undulating EKG pattern. So drugs that prolong the QT interval are going to increase the risk of torsades. And so these include the class 3 antiarrhythmics, which uh, are the potassium channel blockers, your class 1A antiarrhythmics, uh, which is a category of your sodium uh, channel blockers. Other drugs that prolong the QT interval, these are the ones you probably need to remember more, macrolides, haloperidol, that's going to be an antipsychotic chloroquine, and that's going to be an anti-malarial drug, and then the protease inhibitors for HIV. So let's go through those again, macrolides, haloperidol, chloroquine, and protease inhibitors. And what do we generally treat for dorsage? Just to throw in here, remember we're going to push IV magnesium. Let's switch categories here, let's go to hematology. So we have a 44-year-old woman in the hospital for a deep venous thrombosis of the right uh, lower leg. After several days of treatment, her platelet count drops to uh, 30,000 per microliter. Uh, this one is actually pretty easy, so you know that she has um, a serious clotting thing going on, so you're probably going to be anticoagulating that people. So thrombocytopenia can result from administration of heparin, and it actually has its own acronym, H-I-T, uh, so heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Other things like cimetidine, and uh, that's an H2 blocker, uh, that medication could also uh, cause 
cause thrombocytopenia. We'll see cimetidine over and over again today. What about agranulocytosis? So we have the big three C's. You need to remember clozapine, carbamazepine, and colchicine. Uh, then there's a few other things you have to add on here. You have some antithyroid drugs, so propothal, uracil, and methimazole. And then you can also have dapsone. So let's say those again. The three C's, clozapine, carbamazepine, colchicine, the two antithyroid drugs, propothal, uracil, and methimazole. And then the final drug is dapsone. So all these drugs can cause agranulocytosis. Next we have aplastic anemia. What can cause that? Think of chloramphenicol, think of benzene, think of NSAIDs, think of propothal uracil, and methimazole. Next we have gray baby syndrome. So uh, that's always an interesting one. That's chloramphenicol. So this is a toxic accumulation of a toxic uh, chloramphenicol metabolites. So this occurs in infants because uh, the UDP glucuronal transferase enzyme is immature and is unable to metabolize the drug very well. So uh, babies vomit, uh, they're even going to have this kind of ashen gray color. A lot of limp muscles, hypotension, cyanosis, cardiovascular collapse. How about hemolysis in a G6PD deficient patient? So isoniazid can cause this. Think of sulfonamides, primaquin, uh, aspirin in high doses, ibuprofen, nitrofurantoin, uh, that's a UTI drug, also dapsone, fava beans, naphthalene. So all these drugs, these can all cause hemolysis in a G6PD deficient patient. So a long, long list there. Next, we have thrombotic complications. Uh, this would be primarily uh, oral contraceptive pills. That's going to be a big one, especially if they're a smoker, especially over the age of 35. Okay, so let's see if we can remember uh, all this stuff. Let's go through game show number one here. Uh, and remember, yell out the answer when you know it. First one here, we have doxorubicin, donorubicin. Answer, dilated cardiomyopathy. Next, chloroquine, haloperidol, macrolides. Remember, that's going to be torsades de point. Remember, that's going to be that prolonging of the QT interval. Next, we have uh, colchicine, carbamazepine, clozapine. They all start in C. So the answer is agranulocytosis. Next, we have chloramphenicol. Always going to associate that with gray baby. Next, we have niacin, vancomycin. What are you going to get with that? Flushing. Next, we have cimetidine. Heparin, and you're going to end up with the answer of thrombocytopenia. All right, so that's going to be it for the game show. Let's move on to our next category, and we're going into the respiratory system. Our vignette here is a 56-year-old man presents with slowly worsening shortness of breath over the past several months. He denies cough, fever, or any other ill-like symptoms. He has a past medical history of atrial fibrillation. The answer here is amiodarone. So amiodarone is often given to patients with AFib, uh, and a very important side effect is pulmonary fibrosis. Now, so remember with amiodarone, you have to check your PFTs, your pulmonary function tests, your LFTs, your liver function tests, and your T. EFTs, your thyroid function tests. Now other medications that can cause pulmonary fibrosis include bleomycin and busulfane. Uh, so those are both anti-cancer drugs. Next we have cough. So if you ever hear of cough, probably the one you're going to most uh, quickly come to is going to be the ACE inhibitors. They can cause that kind of tickly cough. And the meteor of that was what molecule? Remember it was bradykinin. So bradykinin is in excess and that's causing that cough. Now the ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers, don't cause that increase in bradykinin, so don't get confused there. They are often substituted for ACE inhibitors when patients get that cough. Let's move on to GI. So a 32-year-old woman presents with several days of worsening bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. About two to three weeks ago, the patient uh, was ill with a sore throat for which she received treatment. What does she have? A little vague here, but this is probably pseudomembranous colitis. And what causes it? Well, basically any antibiotic can cause this, but the two that probably get the most test questions regarding this are going to be clindamycin and then uh, one of the amino penicillins like amoxicillin or ampicillin. So this patient likely got maybe amoxicillin for a strep throat inf infection. Moving on, so hepatic necrosis, this can be seen with uh, excess halophane, excess acetaminophen, that's a, always a real terrible uh, outcome, uh, valproic acid, and then the amanita phylloides, and that's going to be a mushroom toxin. That can also be very problematic for that hepatic necrosis. What about good old-fashioned just hepatitis? We'll think of INH, uh, that's going to be isoniazid. Let's move on to endocrine. So we have a 66-year-old man presents with a progressive enlarging breast tissue. He has a past medical history of congestive heart failure. What's the drug? So this patient is likely on spironolactone for the CHF, though uh, it occurs much less often. You also think about digoxin uh, that has a potential for causing gynecomastia. I don't think I've ever seen that myself. Uh, other things that cause gynecomastia include estrogens, obviously, cimetidine. We keep hitting cimetidine uh, throughout uh, this lecture day. Chronic alcohol use can do that. Ketoconazole is the other real big one that I want you to remember as well. 
and then marijuana use. Next we have tertiary adrenal insufficiency. So this can be caused by withdrawal from corticosteroids in a patient that is dependent upon those exogenous corticosteroids. So think of a patient with autoimmune disease, very severe asthma or rheumatologic diseases. Next one, we have hot flashes. That can be caused by uh, some of our hormonal therapy, but think of a tamoxifen, also clomiphene. Uh, these are SERMs, so selective estrogen receptor modulators. Uh, beware, those can cause those hot flashes. Hypothyroidism, maybe always think about amiodarone. Remember our TFTs when we were thinking about that. It can also be caused by lithium, that's another big one, and sulfonamides. All right, it's time for game show number two. Remember, don't forget to yell at the answer. First one here. First, we have busulfane bleomycin, and amiodarone. That's gonna be pulmonary fibrosis. Next, we have ketoconazole, estrogens, and spironolactone. That's gonna be gynecomastia. Next, we have ampicillin, amoxicillin, clindamycin, that one's pretty easy, pseudomembranous colitis. Next, we have amiodarone, sulfonamides, lithium, that one's a little bit trickier, hypothyroidism. Finally here, we have valproic acid, excess acetaminophen, and halothane. Remember, that's gonna be that horrible hepatic necrosis. All right, that's, that's it for game show number two. Let's move on to musculoskeletal. So we have a 50-year-old man presenting with a swollen, red, painful right first toe. Uh, this began spontaneously. He has a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. What meds are we thinking of here? Well, he likely has gout here. Uh, that's sort of the stereotypical looking uh, gout presentation there. Uh, so you need to remember that the diuretics, things like loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics can actually exacerbate gout. The one that you may not have thought of in this patient is maybe niacin. Uh, maybe he has some low HDL, he's taking niacin for that. Uh, it doesn't just cause flushing, it can cause uh, gout as well. Uh, other drugs you might want to think about, cyclosporin and uh, pyrazinamide. Moving on to gingival hyperplasia. So classically here, you're going to always think of phenytoin. Uh, verapamil, though I've never seen it, uh, can also be associated with gingival hyperplasia as well. Next, we have osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, uh, pretty broad here, but think of corticosteroids, think of heparin. So any patient that's going to be on corticosteroids for at least three months should be on a prophylactic dose of a bisphosphonate to maintain that uh, bone density. Next, we have photosensitivity. So you want to think of sulfonamides, amiodarone, and tetracycline. So all these cause photosensitivity. Remember, we had a great mnemonic that's been around forever, SAT for photo. So S-A-T for photo for photosensitivity. Next, we have Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So remember, this includes seizure drugs uh, and antibiotics, and those antibiotics are usually sulfonamides and penicillins. Uh, you also have your seizure drugs. So the seizure drugs like ethosuximide, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenytoin, phenobarbital. And then the, the last one you have to remember is allopurinol. Uh, and again, that's a gout medication. Next, we have lupus-like syndrome, or drug-induced lupus. Uh, so the mnemonic here is SHIPP, S-H-I-P-P. Uh, so S is for uh, sulfonamides, H is for hydralazine, I is for isoniazid, P is for uh, procainamide, and the other P is for phenytoin. Next, we have tendonitis, tendon rupture, and cartilage damage. Uh, think of fluoroquinolone. So you might get a question about a runner who gets Achilles tendonitis or tenderness after taking something like ciprofloxacin. Okay, let's move on to renal. So we have a 27-year-old woman presenting with fever, dysuria, and lower back pain. Her labs show a creatinine of 2.5, eosinophil urea, uh, and urine white cell casts. So this patient has also a past medical history of hypertension, chronic lower back pain. So what do you think is going on here? Well, the diagnosis is a little bit tricky, uh, but this patient has interstitial nephritis. Uh, so she might be taking NSAIDs for her chronic back pain. She may also be uh, taking furosemide for her uh, hypertension. Antibiotics are also very common causes of interstitial nephritis. A lot of drugs causing interstitial nephritis. Next, we have diabetes insipidus. So this can be caused by lithium and demeclocycline. Now, remember, what were the drugs that we used to treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Remember, that's going to be hydrochlorothiazide. Next, we have Fanconi syndrome. We don't see this too often. Uh, this is a proximal tubular defect. And if the proximal tubules uh, aren't working, then you're going to spill all kinds of stuff in your urine that you should be reabsorbing. So this can be associated with expired tetracyclines. That's a little hard to remember. It can also be associated with heavy metal exposure as well as Wilson's disease. Next, we have hemorrhagic cystitis. This is going to be associated with cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide. 
Okay guys, let's move on to Neuro. So our vignette here is a 58 year old man presenting with a new onset tremor in the hands. He has a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, and chronic nausea. So this one's maybe a little bit vague. So this patient might have gastroparesis due to his diabetes. And for that problem, we also use uh, metoclopramide. And that's gonna improve, uh, improve gastric emptying. So metoclopramide can cause that Parkinson-like syndrome, that tremor. Other drugs that we're going to talk about here are the antipsychotics. So a big one there, and reserpine is, is the last one you need to remember as well for that tremor. Next, we have synchronism. So what is synchronism? So it's dizziness with headache, vision changes, and tinnitus. So remember the dizziness with a headache, vision changes, and tinnitus. That's synchronism. And it can be caused by uh, quinidine, which is a class 1A antiarrhythmic, or quinine. So quinidine or quinine, both Qs. Next, we have seizures, and that can be associated with bupropion. Uh, so if you have someone that maybe you're putting on bupropion for either depression or to stop smoking, you need to make sure that they don't have any history of seizures or history of head injuries that might induce seizures. Amipenem with celestatin can be associated with seizures as well. Isoniazid, uh, there are lots of other things associated with increasing seizures. Tramadol, which is a, a pain medicine, uh, that can be associated with seizures as well. Metoclopramide, what we talked about before. Of course, withdrawing from medications, like withdrawing from benzos or alcohol or even other anti-seizure medications can cause this as well. And the last one here, tardic of dyskinesia uh, is associated with antipsychotics. All right, so it's time for game show number three. Let's see how we do on these. First one here, tetracycline, amiodarone, sulfonamides. You might be sitting for this one. Remember, sat for photosensitivity. Next we have uh, quinine and quinidine. Remember, that's gonna be the two cues for synchronism. Next we have verapamil and phenytoin. Always think of phenytoin on this one, gingival hyperplasia. Next, we have procainamide, isoniazid, Hydralazine, that one might be a little tricky, but it's part of a mnemonic of SHIP. Remember, that's our lupus-like syndrome or drug-induced lupus. Next, we have fluoroquinolones. Hmm, think of tendonitis on that one. Next, we have antibiotics, seizure drugs, and allopurinol. Another tricky one, but that's gonna be Stevens-Johnson syndrome. All right, so let's end this up. Uh, we have a multi-organ one, so things that might cause multiple problems. Uh, Disulfiram-like reactions include drugs like uh, metronidazole, certain cephalosporins, procarbazine, uh, which is an anti-cancer uh, alkylating agent, uh, first-generation sulfonylureas, which we really don't use anymore, and disulfiram, of course, itself will cause that terrible reaction. Drugs with nephrotoxicity and neurotoxicity, that's gonna include things like aminoglycosides, cisplatin, and polymyxins. Now drugs that are both nephrotoxic, ototoxic, remember that's going to be uh, aminoglycosides, vancomycin, loop diuretics, and cisplatin. And then finally we have, we have some anticholinergic effects, and we've gone over a lot of this in previous lectures. Uh, more specifically, these are the anti-muscarinic side effects, uh, and a lot of different drugs will have these side effects. Remember these uh, drugs will dry you up. Atropine is anticholinergic, uh, but there are other drugs that have these same effects. Think of the TCAs, the tricyclic antidepressants, H1 blockers that, like diphenhydramine used over the counter, low potency uh, neuroleptics like a thyridazine, a clopromazine. Uh, remember, and you don't wanna give these drugs to patients who have a lot of delirium or dementia already. Uh, also BPH patients, you might get some uh, problems with urinating uh, if, if you give this to them as well. All right guys, so that makes us to the end of the lecture. It's time for that end of session quiz. Let's go through these answers together. All right, first question here, what medication causes cardiotoxicity and bone marrow suppression? So think of those anti-cancer drugs, because all anti-cancer drugs are going to cause some bone marrow uh, suppression, but think of the doxorubicin and the donorubicin. Next, an African-American male that goes to Africa develops anemia after taking prophylactic medication for primary disease prevention. What enzyme is this patient deficient in? Well, remember, this is going to be that G6PD patient. And so which drugs cause hemolysis in that G6PD deficient patient? Remember, primaquine is one. Uh, the patient here most likely took primaquine because uh, the malaria prophylaxis in this question is probably what we're going for here, and that's going to lead to that hemolysis. Next question, a 65-year-old male uh, patient asking mul uh, taking multiple medications presents with gynecomastia. Uh, which meds would be responsible for this patient's gynecomastia? So the big ones that you probably need to see on tests uh, more often are spironolactone and ketoconazole. But you also want to remember estrogens, cimetidine, uh, chronic alcohol use, and marijuana use as well. Next, a patient presents with tinnitus, dizziness, headache, and GI distress. What drug is causing these symptoms? So this patient is presenting with synchronism. And remember, that's with the Q. So this is either quinine or quinidine uh, for this patient. 
Next, what medications are known for causing drug-induced lupus? So remember that mnemonic SHIP. Uh, so sulfonamides, hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, and phenytoin. So these are all the drugs that cause uh, that antihistone antibody drug-induced lupus. All right, guys, so that gets us to the end of Farm 11. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. What are you doing? Arrgh! A nasty, salty sea dog! It's Captain Hal now! What? Uh, well, shiver me, Timber! Oh, so you're a pirate now. I mean, I get it. Chicks dig the whole Johnny Depp thing. But, frankly, you don't quite pull it off. I, on the other hand, could kill with that! No, silly. I'm getting into character for today's mnemonic. The drugs that cause a lupus-like syndrome. S-H-I-P-P. -P. Sulfasalazine, hydralazine, isoniazid, phenytoin, and procainamide. Ship! Okay, so now that that's done and over with, hand over the pack, you matey. My patch. I'd be in search of oh, booty! No, 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 no,